All right, hey everybody. Um, here with a special treat here with Brian Halligan, um, CEO and co-founder of HubSpot. And Brian has been kind enough as well as his co-founder Darmesh to join us many times at Saster over the years. But this is a special one. HubSpot just crossed 1 billion in AR and 100,000 paying customers. So congratulations, Brian. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Thank you for having me. It's a real honor to be here. I'm a giant fan of yours and Sasters. Well, thank you. Um, I want to kind of do, we've been doing this five interesting learning series on Saster where I pick out the five things as a founder that I think are interesting about HubSpot. And it was fun that you want to do this live and chat about it. But before we get there, did you, when you, I, I know in the early days, it's hard to even see it a billion, but did you think you would get there with a hundred thousand paying customers? Did you think it might be a million? Was this the ACV and and the type of customer makeup you thought you'd have when you got to this stage? Honestly, we never thought much about what the makeup would be when we get to a billion dollars, because we weren't thinking much about getting to a billion dollars in the early days. We were looking to get the product market fit and go to market market fit and really focused on just growing in the moment. So somebody, I was on somebody else's podcast and they were asking me, well, back in the day, when did you think you'd get to a billion? And I, when we started the company, we hoped we would get here, but we would have put very low odds on it. And yep. uh, so I'm not sure we really thought a lot about the mix. Having said that, the ARPU of HubSpot hasn't changed that much over our 14 years. Yeah, that to me is very interesting, right? You've added, you've added a lot more functionality. You've added gone much broader, much broader, but the ARPU is the same. So what are the, what are the learnings there? Oh, you've got CRM, you've got support, you've got this whole suite now, and it's still $10,000, isn't it? it? It is. And it's because the denominator is so much bigger. We, we leaned hard. We pivoted halfway through HubSpot from a marketing app to a CRM platform. And we're still kind of halfway through that pivot. Uh, and when we did that, we decided to go heavy freemium, and we decided to go with, make it easier to start if you're a little tiny startup, there's two of you getting going, and then you get to 20 employees, we want a price point that you can get into it with a starter edition, then a pro and an enterprise. So we introduced that starter edition inside of HubSpot at a relatively low price point, and you can buy our whole starter suite now for $50 a month. So it's a little deceiving. If you took the starter suite out, the ARPU would have gone way, way up over time. But okay, we, that's the subtlety I'm missing. But what yeah. we really did, and we, it's a little current too, because everyone always moves up market, up market, up market. We actually kind of slid down market for a little while, and we just want to make it easier for people to buy and easier for startups to get in early and then scale with us versus buy some other crappy platform, then have to switch to HubSpot somewhere along the way. And did you, just going back a little bit, and I want to talk about kind of the revenge of the SMB, which is what I think we're seeing in 2021, right? But, bit, but, yeah. but back in the day when you saw folks like Marketo and Eloqua take off, and I know we're dating ourselves a little bit, right? But you weren't tempted, and I know you got leads from some of their biggest customers. They came in, right? They must've seen, look, uh, Hub HubSpot, HubSpot's better for me, or at least you're in the deal. You get in the deal. You weren't tempted a bit to chase those bigger ACVs? Uh, everyone around us was tempted. All our investors <laughs> were tempted. Our board members were tempted. I bet they the were. Your investors were. were. Yeah. We were not. And there's, I reread, so I'm not a big fan of Peter Thiel's politics, but yep. he said something really smart in his book way back when. He said, you have to be right about something for a long period of time that everyone else thinks you're wrong about. And I think we were right about our target market. Everyone else in the world, still our big investors are like, well, when are you gonna go sell to the Fortune 500? We always thought that there'd be a giant market down below that Fortune 500 for startups that wanted to scale from two employees to 2000 employees and build a killer product for those people. And our thesis was that historically, no one made money in that because you couldn't sell to them. You couldn't market to them. You needed this field sales force. You had to fly people. It's just the cost to acquire is too expensive. And our thesis was really obvious in retrospect that you could dramatically drop tack by using consumer-like marketing techniques, inbound marketing, content marketing, freemium to get to these people. And so I think we were right about that for a long period of time and lots of other people were wrong. Um, and a little bit of, uh, and, and you have to get the math right to pull that off. And it took us a long time to get the math right, but that's kind of how I think about it. I also, I'll just tell you personally, I think Darmesh feels the same way. 
I grew up in my career in enterprise software, selling to the Fortune 500, selling to yep. the CIO, and it's like, it's a hard life. I mean, it's just not a super fulfilling. And I wanted a life that was a little bit different than that. I didn't want to have to be chasing CIOs around for the rest of my life. So we wanted to, you know, bring a consumerization that people have been talking about consumerization of enterprise software for 150 years. It finally happened over the last couple. Yeah, it's interesting. We've seen I, when I've done these five interesting learnings, I've watched some folks like PagerDuty, right, which which eventually went up market slack we know the majority of their revenue is they crossed a billion hubspot said a billion right as they crossed a billion more than half their revenue became enterprise and we can remember using slack in the early days and it was almost dev focused right yes. um but if i look at your numbers um i mean your growth this last quarter was 30 some odd percent right which i think was even up over over year over year quarter over quarter right yes, the growth rate, accelerating. Right? accelerating with smbs right so what does that mean? Is it is it is it just SMBs finally getting to use this these these SaaS products? What it, is it? Is it just the because it's not just the cloud getting big. This is SMBs in particular. This is not CIO budget, right? What what's happened? Did it just take SMBs a while to get here? Why why beyond HubSpot being a world class product, are SMBs accelerating now? I think these products are getting easier to buy and easier to use and approachable for SMBs. And that just wasn't the case for the longest, longest time. The market is there. If you add up the number of SMBs, it's, it's a giant number. And if you add the ARPU of what someone would pay, it is an absolutely ginormous market. Uh, and the good news for HubSpot is we're like 2% into that market. That market is very, very big. And they're just waking up to SaaS that they can use it. And most of this market, the market today versus 14 years ago is very different. The buyer of HubSpot 14 years ago was kind of a Luddite. You know, they, they did press releases and they did sort of, you know, brochures and stuff like that. The buyer has changed and they're pretty technical and they're very savvy with software and they're very yep. fast with software. And that's been a sea change in our buyers that uh, our original buyer was someone we called Mary Marketer and Mary Marketer was kind of a Luddite, didn't really understand, didn't understand technology well, didn't use it well. We had to teach her how to use technology. Our buyer today is very, very different. It's pretty savvy actually with technology. Maybe they're not writing code in the middle of the night, but they know how to use software and they know how to deploy it and get value out of it. Well, that's an interesting inversion of the typical early adopter phase, right? Where the early folks like in Slack are super techie and then eventually yeah. you get to Mary or, or, or Mark, whatever, whatever his, uh, his persona is, but it, that's been flipped around in the case of HubSpot, right? A little right? bit, yeah. We never had that like crossing the chasm curve. I've read, read, read and reread crossing the chasm so many times. We never had that like early adopter techie type. It was more, we went after Mary Marketer and Mary Marketer, gosh, she was in a lot of pain. Like she was doing trade shows and she was doing press releases and brochures and the world was changing under her feet and she was trying to figure it out. And part of what the magic of HubSpot was, we built an app that was easy for her to use. We created content for her. We created training in a university and we helped create that new profession, that new marketing profession. And we helped make her, you know, progress in her career. So it's a little bit of a software play. It was also very much a community and content and training play yeah and did now thinking back of that transition from 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 mary and mike to, to the more tech focused did that was was going freemium later in life correlated to that did you need did you want to go freemium in part to get into more more tech focused customers or is that just a coincidence um it's uh, well first of all it's not really even tech focused like your average liberal arts graduate that's 28 years old is pretty facile with technology. Well, they're today. fluent in the web. Anyone, anyone yeah. in, in the, ne the next generations is fluent in the web, right? And, they're and, fluent. And that, they're fluent. And it, it's like myself. Like I'm fluent in the web. I'm I know how to use it. Uh, and so it's we're not even going after deeply technical people. Just your, your average person who's 28 years old today is pretty good at using technology. Your average person who's my age now is pretty good with technology. Your average person 14 years ago, whether they were 28 or my age was pretty bad at it. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, I guess I would just say that it's just remarkable how much it's changed there. Like you used to teach people how to reset their password and stuff like that. It's amazing how much it's changed. And I forgot your question. Ask the question. Oh, Thanks. it's more just, it, it's one of the things, there's a couple things that are not unique to HubSpot, but are interesting. And one is going freemium later, oh, right? right? Not starting there. 
and I know it's the case, but I don't actually know why and if that is tied to the change in some of your buyer personas. It was, so about seven years ago, we pivoted from being, we're a marketing app, uh, inbound marketing, marketing automation, content marketing websites, all that kind of stuff. And we pivoted to, we want to solve a different problem. We want to be a CRM platform. We want to help people create awesome, ex disruptive experiences for their own customers. And so we very much pivoted at that point. When we pivoted our vision for the company, we said we wanted to pivot our business model and have not only a disruptively easy product, but make it disruptively easy to buy relative to the big incumbents in the space. So we said, let's make it freemium. No one else was doing freemium in the CRM space. Let's make the product so easy to use that somebody who's in a startup in their garage comes in, just starts using HubSpot. They get all their contacts in there. They're emailing out of it. They build their website. Next thing you know, they're on HubSpot and we grow with them. And so it was really, a, it was really at that time when we pivoted our business model and our product strategy. Uh, it, so it was very much sure. The other thing about HubSpot, we're always very rooted in this idea of you want to match the way you go to market with the way humans actually shop for things and buy things. And the way human shop and buy has changed so much in the last 14 years. And whether you're selling, I think, to the Fortune 500 or you're selling to a two-person startup, I think freemium is the way to go uh, in almost any model because no one wants to talk to your sales rep anymore. <laughs> and they really don't. They just want to try it themselves and set it up. Uh, and yeah, you'll talk to your sales rep later on down the road once they've figured out that it might be a good fit. They want to figure out the packaging and they want some detailed questions answered. But you want to match your go-to-market with the way people actually want to buy stuff today. Yeah, it's interesting. Let's tie that a little bit to another thing that is not uncommon, but is in, very interesting about HubSpot, which is partners in the channel, right? Yeah. So uh, I might not want to talk to a sales rep the day I try HubSpot CRM marketing, right? But clearly, if 40% of your revenue comes from partners in the channels, I want help deploying a world-class marketing and CRM solution, right? I want, and when I see that, <laughs> There's because there's there's almost there's not a conflict, but there's an overlap between freemium product and solution. And as you become more of a solution, most businesses want help, don't they? I don't want to do all the heavy lifting, right? I want someone to help me do this work, even if the software seems to be easy to deploy. Okay, it turns out it's about 50-50 across our customers. 50% uh, just want to do it themselves and they buy yep. directly from us and they set it up themselves. We teach them how to do it, we teach them how to fish. 50% of them need a bunch of help and they'll buy through an agency partner or a serum implementer. We have like 5,000 of these partners. They're terrific. And they know our product cold and they go in and they do big consulting projects and they set the thing up. They may use it for them. They may run it for them. And so it splits like 50, 50. Um, and so we have a good sized channel and that channel takes really good care of our customers. In fact, the retention rate of our customers that come through our channel is a little bit better than the retention rate of our customers that come through the direct channel. Well, maybe, and they, there may even be more coverage. There may be more people working in your channel than there are at HubSpot it, itself, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So our channel, like we do a billion in revenue, our channel's five. If you add in the, the partners, it's five billion. That was the question I was asking. What's the multi, like how much, five how X. much does, a, if on a 10K HubSpot deployment, I know that's an average, so it's a little misleading. Probably the partners drive it up a bit, but how yeah. much more do they, do you have a sense of how much more they pay the partner to do, to do the work? Yeah, Is it one X or two? Oh, it's five X. Yeah. It's five X. Got it. Yeah. If you look yeah. at SAP, it's like 50 X and we're about five X. <laughs> yeah. And I know the answer is no, but just looking back, were you, were you tempted to bring more of that revenue in house? Salesforce obviously didn't want it. Right. But you look at others like Qualtrics that IPO, right. They really like having that revenue in house because they made it profitable. Were you ever tempted to do more of that work or just, you never, no. never had any interest, right. Even if you can make it profitable. I'll tell you something weird about valuations. Historically, the way someone would value a company like HubSpot that has 95% software and 5% services, and let's say the software gross margins are 82 and the services are whatever it is, we're a little bit negative. 30, 30, let's right? Let's say it's yeah. 30, whatever it is. They would value the software revenue at, call it 10x, whatever, and they'd value the service revenue at 2x. For whatever reason, they don't do that anymore. And they no just- No one cares. Like, they don't care. And, and, and the canonical example of that is Shopify, where they have this fantastic growing SaaS business that is multiple, that is valued an unbelievable multiple because it's growing really fast. They have this giant payments business that is low margin business. And larger, it's larger. Incredibly fast. Yeah. They just blend them together and they get SaaS multiples. So the world has changed the way they think about it. 
So when we started HubSpot, it was very much in that old world. So for one, that was one big reason we didn't want a lot of services revenue. Two is, is one of the early, one of our early board members had started a marketing automation company and failed. And the lesson he gave us was marketers like services. I mean, you look at any marketing budget and there's so many agencies doing different things. It's like, you can very easily get wrapped up in doing all of this services. And our early customers wanted us to do all, like, can you write our blogs for us? Can you do our social media posts? And all? And they wanted us to do all that stuff, but we could have easily done it. Um, but we said, we kind of flipped it and said, actually, can we turn this into an opportunity and build a partner channel and build a big community around us, which is a big moat and enable them to just sell it. And so that's kind of how we thought of it. I could imagine you, like you're saying, you probably, and sometimes founders see this today too, you could almost have been sucked into being a super agency, right? People Easy. would have wanted you to do all, okay, I have this agency and there's software, just you do, you guys do it all for me. You, you write my blog, you do my actual SEO engineering, you do my ads, you do every, I want everything from you, right? And I'll pay you a hundred grand a year, right? Instead of 10 grand a year, if you do everything, right? Totally. I'll yeah. tell you an early story. We had, so you, you know, our first sales guy, it's a guy named Mark Robert, who spoke to face your conference and stuff. Uh, and I remember the first customer he signed up, Jason, was a company called CEO Dad. And I, I don't know if he's still around, <laughs> CEODad.com. And he was a professional, uh, uh, he was a professional comedian and his professional dad joke guy. And Mark signed him up and we didn't really know what we were selling at the time. This guy was like our fourth customer. And Mark said, no problem. We're going to have our founder write your jokes for you and read Oh, man. He he'll like, sell, he just, he'll he'll your shit for you. Throw anything into the deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, no, 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 no. He doesn't have to write the jokes for me, but uh, I'd love to work. With you. And so I remember my first call with him. It was, it was the night he purchased. So he ding the deal. And that night, I was up to dinner. It was 8 o'clock at night. There's a restaurant down the street from my house. And I got a call. And I never really get calls on my phone. And so if I get a call on my phone, I assume it's urgent. So I picked it up and it sure enough was CEO dad. And I say, hey, nice to meet you, whatever. And he said, oh, I need, need, you, need your help right now. I'm like, all right. And so he said, look on your phone. I just sent you my first blog article. I said, okay, I'll read it tomorrow. I said, no, 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 you got to read it now. And I was like, okay. I started reading the article. And he said, no, 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 read it out loud. Okay, so I'm on the sidewalk reading his article out loud on the sidewalk and I'm about halfway through it he said what are you doing and I said I'm reading your article he said you're not laughing I said it's not funny <laughs> and so that was the kind of stuff I was getting sucked into I could <laughs> take your 60 hours a week right there <laughs> totally and then anyway I went back and forth on his damn blog article and then I posted it on reddit and I don't know, it's a disaster. I'm like, Mark, stop doing that. Just don't sell <laughs> software. <laughs> and that was one of the early formative moments. I was like, this can't be my life for the next 20 years. <laughs> you know, a little bit of scar tissue can focus you as a founder yes. and lead to a great outcome, right? Yes. You, you could have had, you could have been more enterprise if you just didn't have this little bit of scar tissue. <laughs> we and... could have easily <laughs> built a giant services company. Darmesh and I yeah. knew a lot about services and, or a lot about how to do SEO and content marketing. We could have easily done it. Could have done it. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> it would have been a bad move. Uh, let me just pick, uh, uh, I don't want to spend all our time, but this, this, this 50% from the partners in the channels and doing, so you didn't want to be enterprise, right? But you did embrace agencies, which are quirky and a lot of work. And I've learned a lot about this. I don't know how many folks in marketing do this, probably, but I've learned in the Shopify ecosystem, all the winners in Shopify do this. All the winning Shopify partners partner with the Shopify agencies. You got to do it. The, the Clavios and the Gorgeouses. So um, just two questions for folks thinking about that. One, I'm curious. Do your part are they are they HubSpot only shops in terms of just you as an application? Do they do other competitors? Do they do other products? Right? Do they specialize? And how do you keep them? How do you invest in them? The vast majority are are selling. They're not selling Salesforce and Dynamics and Adobe. They're selling HubSpot and servicing HubSpot. But you know, I'd say ten percent of them, and some of the bigger ones support all of them. Um, okay. Uh, Oftentimes they're building a solution with HubSpot. So they put in HubSpot, they put in Gong, they put in, um, you name it. You know, we have thousands, we have many hundreds of partners that plug into HubSpot. So they'll plug all kinds of stuff into HubSpot. With HubSpot as the hub though. So they want, oh, they, do they want to webify their business or do they want to automate customer market? Like why do they go to the agency, right? 
Any um, number of reasons. Like yeah. they may start with, hey, we want a new website and they build them a new website. A new website, got it. And then they say, oh, you know, we want to, we have this database. It's a mess. Can you clean up our database? We can segment it. And then, oh, we, can you help us with account based marketing with HubSpot? It's like, oh, our CRM, like we never really use our CRM. We got this old CRM and like our reps never use, maybe we could just use HubSpot for that. Can you train our reps how to use it? Like it kind of grows from there. And yep. they can kind of come in at different angles, but they typically, HubSpot is the hub, not let's say Salesforce or Dynamics. And Salesforce has a lot of great partners and Dynamics does too, and they're pretty dedicated. I think it's hard for them to have multiple hubs. It's just a lot to keep in their heads. It's a lot, it's a lot. It yeah. is, um, but they typically are building a solution with lots of different apps. Most of our HubSpot customers now, decent sized customers will have 20 other applications plugged into HubSpot. And, running workflows and they've got survey monkey and they've got Eventbrite and they've got Devi and they've got all this different stuff that they're plugging in and they kind of run use HubSpot as their hub. Is 20 um and just two two on this and then one last question for one at a time, but is that the stack? Do folks run 20 apps integrated with HubSpot? Is it one plus 20? Is that a typical a, a, a typical deployment you it, see? It, it really varies on the uh, company size, but if you're you know, we have lots of comp uh, HubSpot customers that let's say are 100 employees or so. They'll have 20 apps plugged into HubSpot. And do you have a sense, because it, it isn't, do you know what their total deployment for SaaS software might be for the all of that? Like, what do they spend? Because HubSpot then is just, HubSpot actually is a small slice, even if it's it the is. hub of that overall. It's not like Salesforce where it's often half. Like, if you take Salesforce plus deployment, that can suck up half your budget, right, in some cases. Yep. But if I'm doing 10K on HubSpot or 15K and more to deploy, but... I got Gong and Bevy. I'm spending hundreds, a hundred plus thousand dollars on top of it, aren't I? Gong is expensive, really expensive. Yeah. So if they're using Gong, it's expensive. But if you're using Bevy or you're using Hopin and you've got SurveyMonkey and you plug it and you've got your your NetSuite connected into it, it kind of depends on what's going to like. NetSuite's expensive, but maybe you've got QuickBooks plugged in, that's inexpensive. So uh, you know, when we look at that, we look at the five to one. It's like two to one on other software products plugged into HubSpot. That's interesting. Two, twice the expense on your partner yes. ecosystem, right? Yes. So if and I it, hit it, if I hit it as a HubSpot partner, I can make a lot of money. This oh, is a lesson yeah. to folks. Because that two to one is much higher than, some, than a Workday or yes. a Salesforce or even a Shopify. Yes. It's much higher than Shopify, right? That's a huge multiplier if you're a top 10, top 20 HubSpot uh, ecosystem app, isn't it? It's huge. It is. And the ecosystem has evolved. There's different types of partners in the ecosystem. Like we always have Facebook and Google, these giant ones. Um, and then we have like the venture backed startups and like Hopin and Bevy are good examples of that because they're top of mind. Um, but then we're starting to see more and more companies just start on HubSpot. Like there's a great company called OrgChart Hub and, they, and yep. they make it really easy within the CRM to build an org chart that you can use and share within our CRM. Like, more and more entrepreneurs are sort of building their whole business around HubSpot. The other thing that's happening that's interesting is a lot of these partners we work with, like we have software partners and then we have services partners. These services partners, I mean, with the advent of JavaScript, your average sort of developer that, that doesn't have a CS degree can do amazing stuff now. And so they're, they're using JavaScript and extending HubSpot in amazing ways with one-off things they're building on top of HubSpot. That is mushrooming on top of the inner ecosystem as well. Got it. I didn't I didn't completely realize why there's affinity with Zapier and similar applications, but now I get it, right? Because they can make HubSpot so much more extensible, right? Yep. Yeah. All right, last question on this, and I want to just do one last one on sort of free channels. But so these the, the these like how how just for everyone to learn, how defensible, because I view these 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 agencies um and partners if, if if they're hubspot shops right you have to invest in them because if you treat them poorly they will go away eventually right oh, but if you treat them well i find it one of the quiet biggest moats out there right if, when you go to that agency and they're a shopify shop right on their door that's a big deal that that's a totally. big deal right and is it is it a moat for hubspot is it is it defensible is it something people should try to pull off when they can I don't think it's quiet. I think it's a loud moat. <laughs> no, I know it's a loud moat, but I, I think folks that have only sold direct, I don't know what percent of SaaS companies have no, like no third, but it's uh, a lot, right? It, it's it, a giant moat. It's so not a part of the playbook that everyone gets is my point. Right. Not everyone sees it, right? I think it's a giant moat, isn't it? It's a giant moat. It's a huge competitive advantage. They're largely wedded to us. They build their whole business around us. So you think of HubSpot as a billion dollar company, but the HubSpotosphere is this $5 billion entity 
And there's thousands and thousands of people outside of HubSpot who deeply understand the product. They're strongly incented to go sell it and make their customers happy. It's a huge moat. It's, you know, the company who's fantastic at this is Microsoft has a huge community of partners around them. We don't get it. Unless you've seen it, you don't get it. It doesn't make sense yes. to you, right? And I grew up and I have a weird, I grew up at this software company called PTC, it's ad software company. And I spent a bunch of time in their direct channel and we had resellers and implementers and I, and I spent a bunch of time in there. And I was like, this model can work inside a HubSpot. Uh, it's, it was basically a reseller model we had, sort of similar to AutoCAD. People know more about AutoCAD, they go through resellers. And so it was sort of in my DNA because I worked in the channel for a long, long period of time. Yeah, it's, I, I, I continue to learn, I was listening on, we were talking about Clubhouse before and Harley talking about so the president of, of, of Shopify a few years ago when they were neck and neck with big commerce and another, right? And today it's, it's vast. And he was talking about how ease of use and onboarding were the reasons that I'm sure they are. I mean, he's been there since the early days, right? But when I, as a, as a student of this look, I think it's the partner ecosystem. I do too, it's the platform. Right? Because good God, when I, now that I've invested or worked with some folks in the shop, you can't, like it is, you cannot get in there, right? These Shopify shops there, you know, it's a big, I got to go online tomorrow, Brian, there's COVID's hit. And like, if, 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 if you're a Shopify shop, I almost don't, I, I don't care, like get it done for me. Right. And I'm not saying it's the same at HubSpot, but it's, it's an amazing mode if you can do it and understand it. Right. And people don't get it. People don't get why Microsoft wins here. Right. I, I, I didn't get it and it's powerful. Right. And it lowers the risk. Let's say you're. Let's say you're Sasser and you're looking for a CRM and you're like, mm, I could go with HubSpot or I could go with Salesforce, but I'm working with this agency who's built a whole bunch of stuff for me on this other side and they're HubSpot and they, they not implement HubSpot. It just lowers the risk for you. It lowers the risk for you, right? And I think the other interesting line we could talk forever is what, you know, as Sasser Inc. As an S we're a big enough SMB that I'll, I'll throw money at deployment now. Like yeah. I, I have more money than people, right? Yeah. So I, I talk with these vendors, like like event software, talking about events. I mean, we've qualified like 40 digital event software, right? Yeah. And like, I, stop talking to me about what your ACV is. Here's our needs. We're, we're at scale, right? I will pay you more money if you solve these. <laughs> I really yeah. don't care whether it's 10 grand or 20 grand or 40 grand a year. I want you to solve my problem, right? And there's there's an SMB line that HubSpot plays in this space at your ACE, but it's a tough spot, isn't it? It's tough to solve those problems. Those people aren't good at it until it's 100K or more, right? It's real work to do that. Yeah. But your partners yeah. can help you do it. The partners give you that lift, right? At last, yeah, the, the same part, thing. One of right? the things that's been interesting about our partners is our partners pull us up. Like if, if you look at our largest VCD deals, like Lemonade is a customer and uh, we got a whole bunch of big companies uh, that are customers now, SurveyMonkey and other folks. Uh, our, usually it's our partners pulling us in there that are in, they're in there doing other work and they pull us into a bigger deal. Uh, that's that's off, they're, they're sort of a gravity pulling us up. But you were talking about how do you take care of your, your partners? So we do net promoter score on our customers, net promoter score on our employees, net promoter score on our partners. We obsess over raising those and we listen very carefully to our partners. And what our partner, what partners want is they want they want to grow their business. So they want an ecosystem that's growing, there's stuff going on, and they can find ways to make money. Um, they want, if they do well, to get tiered. And it's like amazingly how important tiering is. And Napoleon said this, some, something interesting. Uh, he said, it's amazing what a soldier will do for a little piece of colored cloth on their shoulder. You know, like <laughs> a tiering is really important. And if you're an elite tier partner with HubSpot, you get unbelievable benefits. Um, the people who deal with those partners are really important. Like we have a certain ratio of our, our partner managers to partners. The quality of those people and the engagement is really important. The training you give to partners. So we train the heck out of them, not just on HubSpot, but like, how do you do, do retain, retain, retainers right? How do you hire right? How do you build a culture? Like mm, yep. teach them how to build a services company. That in fact, Jason, is really what enabled it to take off at the beginning. They all were interested in inbound, but they were all interested in our theories on how to run an agency properly. And we built a whole methodology on how to run an agency. That was really key for us in the early days. Yeah, until you see that, the I remember the first time I walked into a software company back in the day that was training their partners in, their, in like in a huge room with like, I'm like, yes. what, what is this room for? Why, yes. why did you fly out 200 partners yes. <laughs> into your company to try? I didn't even get it. It took me a while yes. to figure out what was going on, right? Yes. But if you do that, it's powerful, right? It is so yes. powerful, right? And these partners want help. They're typically like 20 person companies and the CEO is doing a lot of the selling. They're busy, they're yep. haggard. 
and they're like, can you help me grow my business? And our answer is yes, we're going to teach you not just about implementing HubSpot, but we're going to teach about how to grow your business. That's been a key secret for us. All right, last one. I love this partner discussion because it's so it's under discussed, right? It's so interesting. The last one I just want to hit is, and I'll tell you why, is I, I think in your in your last quarterly announcement, not this one, but the last one, you said that 60% of your customers come from free channels, right? That 33% came from word of mouth. If I got this a little wrong, you can correct me or ignore it, but 33% from word of mouth, 26% from SEO and Google, and 13% still from your blog, right? So the reason I bring this up is as founders, we try to learn the case studies of other companies, right? Um, but we have to make sure we get them right or we copy them the wrong, we've learned the wrong lessons. So 60% seems like a lot, right? And I think this might be the secret sauce to why HubSpot's business model works. Because I think for at a 10K ACV with a sales driven model, if you had to pay to acquire all these customers, I don't think the math would work, right? It seems to me this is a magic engine, is this free and maybe 60% consistent with those, but I haven't seen it broken out the way you guys broke it out, right? Between word of mouth, SEO, and blog. We have a few, I guess we have a few little engines that work. One is ye old content marketing, inbound marketing, writing blog articles that are interesting, creating uh, research content that's really interesting, uh, getting links into it, ranking in Google, trying to make that content super compelling so that everywhere people go, whether they're in Twitter or they're on Instagram or they're in Google, they're just seeing our content everywhere. And we're building up a lot of credibility with people. Um, and then, so that's an engine that's just- It doesn't just seem to have a limit, even at a billion in ARR, it's, it doesn't really seem to have a limit, does it? That's something we talk about internally, like the amount of traffic we get through Google, it's, it does, it, we always think, well, that was it, that was the yeah, It's got a plateau, it's got a it plateau, just, right? It but it doesn't. It the problem with it, it takes a long time, you got to build up tremendous amounts of domain authority over a long period of time. And it's, and you know, it's easier to venture back startup, you just got a big round, give the money to Google and Facebook yeah. versus give it to a content creator, the great, great content that will build you a sustainable, moat over a long period of time. That's one thing we have going for us that's super sustainable. The freemium product, like we think of ourselves, we want to, the thing that's different about HubSpot than Salesforce or Adobe or uh, Microsoft or Oracle, all the other CRMs, they started with Salesforce automation and they just bought a whole crap ton of other companies and glued them together and built a CRM that way. And it's a tried and true way of doing it. But I think that's going to, I think this is something that we're, we're right about that that we're going to be right about for a while that everyone thinks we're wrong about, but we're building ours from scratch. Like every line of code is ours and we're building from the ground up and we're building it to be Apple-like easy to use, like really easy to use, super scalable on the back end. And we're building it all from scratch. So we're handcrafting it versus cobbling it. And I think that's going to really benefit us because we do it that way. We can actually do freemium. Like if one of those companies wanted to do freemium, it would fall down on itself because it's hard to stand that darn thing up. It's really hard to use, it's really hard to set up. And so we try to lean into our strengths where maybe our competitors have weaknesses. And so we're trying to zig a little bit where everyone zags. And so just the freemium in the ease of setting it up is a real key for us in growing our business. And then the partner channel is a real key to growing our business. Uh, our culture and our being a really good place to work, that's a real key. So we have like five or six things that we're really, really good at. We suck at a whole bunch of other stuff, but five or six things that are hard to replicate and take time and energy that we've really kind of mastered. Yeah, it, and it takes a lot of that. I think maybe the takeaway from this, it's interesting is a lot of that takes more pa patience, right? It's, it takes a lot of the patience. The real reason, I mean, you're building, you're building rather than buying, um, and the first time I met Darmesh might have been in 2014 or 15 when you guys were thinking through some build buy decisions. It takes longer. The, you know, the, Mark Benioff yeah. doesn't want to waste time. He wants yeah. to hit scale, and, and that's yeah. not necessarily wrong. But the patience of build, I mean, it's years. It's it's yeah. years you get behind to get ahead of that J curve. But if you get it right, you come out ahead on the other side of the J curve, right? But it's it is that's like SEO bet. or other things. It's a long bet, right? It's a long bet, that's right? And I'll tell you about that, that bet that, that, so we did, we have some debates about that bet a few years ago. Like everyone around us is saying one, go to the enterprise and two, start acquiring, just start acquiring. It's like, you have your, your words. You have the brand. 
you have yeah. the brand. So go plug stuff into it, right? And you've got a $23 billion market cap. Let's just, yeah. let's put it to work. And we debated that one a lot. And then we said, we're just going to bet on ourselves. We're going to go the opposite with everyone's telling us to do. We're going to build something that is beautiful, that we're going to love. Our customers are going to love. Our MPS is going to be sky high. And the reason we're accelerating today, as you mentioned, our revenue is accelerating. It's that. We made a bet two and a half years ago that we were going to build. And we did a bunch of stuff at the platform level. And we're getting the return on it today. That's why UpSpot started to reaccelerate this year. Well, good. Well, listen, Brian, thank you for this time. Congratulations on reaccelerating. It's uh, it's wonderful to see. It's inspiring, I think, to all of us to see that and to watch that. It's fun. Now you can, I know you're a public company, but out there in the, out there in the horizon is 10 billion. <laughs> yeah, it's out I there. Know. You can squint. You can squint, yeah, but at 33%, yeah, totally. Totally. you can see it, right? You can see it, right? <laughs> and in fact, you can't tell Wall Street, but there's actually a date on a spreadsheet you have uh, within a couple quarters where where if things go just right, you can see no. 10. It's crazy that you can see 10 billion out on the distant horizon, isn't it? It is crazy. I just I want to say thank you to you. I love your content. I'm a big fan of your conference and everything you do. You're you're fantastic. We we love Saster. I love your Twitter feed. You are the man. Uh, I appreciate you very much. All right, Brian. Thanks for the time and good catching up. All right. Cool.